my name is Ollie Fitton. I am a lecturer in criminology at Lancaster University. Uh, I teach criminology, I teach cybercrime in particular, and also uh, policing modules. So uh, I use quite a lot of role play uh, type activities within my modules. So I like, um, in, we're quite a, a research focused university and we do a lot of uh, critical work. So we're not teaching people to be police officers. We're teaching people to think about some of the kind of issues that come up in policing or uh, cybercrime in particular in one of the courses that I use this uh, technology for. And um, Role plays tend to be, in our university setting, paper-based. Um, so I actually wrote a kind of paper-based role play where the students would be police officers doing a cybercrime investigation uh, and used that a couple of times. But then when I read that one of the learning objectives for a new course that I was taking on um, required them to actually get involved with the use of uh, information technology, I thought, oh, well, here's a good place to bring some in in my cybercrime course. Let's uh, get hold of a VR headset and transform it from a paper-based activity into uh, a virtual reality activity. So that's what I did, basically, was I translated an existing role play that was based uh, on a tabletop into something in virtual reality. So the scenario that I gave them was that there was a uh, drug dealer who was on the run. So a drug dealer had just stolen two million pounds worth of cocaine from another drug dealer uh, and uh, they disappeared. But we had got a warrant to search their house. We found the house and we were going in through the front door and they were digital media investigators, which is a role in policing here in the UK where they have to um, search for digital evidence um, in a cyber supported crime like this to be able to then work out kind of what's taken place, who is this person, where are they now? So the uh, student in uh, the VR headset would then search the house that um, we built uh, and find objects to determine whether they were relevant to the investigation or not. And everybody who was sat in the real world, not in VR, could then kind of shout support to that person or direct them where they should go in the house. Uh, and every time they were able to interact with an object, pick that object up, turn it around, look at it, we would be able to discuss what kinds of evidence we might get out of uh, that object uh, and then whether we were going to seize it or not and what the, the person in VR had to do when they picked up an object, if they decided they were going to seize it so that we could then examine it, uh, they would just put it on a mat, then a rug that was uh, by the front door and that signified that, yeah, we were going to seize that. It was far and away the most engaging session that we had in that entire course. There were people in that first session that spoke who had never said a word in the kind of five previous weeks of the term. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it really broke down some barriers and actually made the rest of the term much easier for those people who weren't very uh, confident to get involved. It made gave them a way in, I suppose, because we'd had that shared experience. Yeah, so actually the use of the headset itself, the use of the technology. So one of the things that we spoke about later in the course, actually, um, was potential for future cybercrimes. So potential for cybercrime within the metaverse, for example. You know, what would that look like? Um, harassment in these kinds of environments is an increasing problem. We've actually just done quite a major investment here at Lancaster into um, digital transformation. Um, there's a few different aspects of that, but one of those is quite a large investment in a lot of uh, Quest 3 headsets, um, which means that I now get to play with the augmented reality aspects of Zoe as well as the VR stuff, which I was able to do in the Quest 2 headset. So I'm really excited about uh, pushing that forwards. It also means that I don't have to stick to the asymmetric design of the, uh, of the the workshop. I'm now going to have one headset for at least every one of those students that's in the workshop. So if we had space, I'd be able to have uh, all of those students in VR. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how we kind of play with all of that resource that we now have. And the reason that I'm really keen to keep using Zoe over other solutions that are out there is the content creation, the ease of content creation and the freedom for content creation uh, in there, where whether it's me, one of my colleagues or the students, and I've seen other applications of even quite young students being able to, um, you know, 
play with the Zoe software and be able to develop scenes themselves. It's got a learning curve, but once you pass the learning curve, it's actually really easy to start creating that stuff there. And that's one of the big problems, especially for creating, um, you know, I have what, 10 hours of workshops per module and I kind of have two or three modules a year. And actually, it's a, it doesn't sound like a lot to kind of teach, but to prepare all that stuff is a huge amount of work. And to then try and develop literally an hour-long game, really, in game development terms for each one of those situations would be impossible. Um, but something like Zoe allows me to do that. So being able to use that, use the kind of technology and the framework that I have, the schema for creating those scenes um, in AR, um, is really exciting because then we can go to different environments and we can overlay things on those environments. I'm, I'm not techie techie. I'm techie enough to be interested, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a developer. I'm not a game designer or anything like that. So as much as I would love to spend a lot of time in Unity or Unreal Engine or something producing my own content, the reality is that isn't my job. <laughs> That's never going to be my job. My my job is to, you know, I have a, a limited amount of time to be able to produce this content for the students. And Zoe gives me the opportunity to do that in a relatively speedy kind of time frame. Do the tutorial and then just play. Just play with it yourself for a little while. So for me, um, it probably took me, I would say, about four or five hours to get comfortable enough in the headset, because that was a new headset to me, and in the software, to be able to fly around the place and just start building things. But once I knew the mechanics and I knew how it worked, it was then a couple of hours to go from having no lesson to having a lesson that I've used year on year that's worked really well. Um, so yeah. Do the tutorial, don't skip, <laughs> um, and then just play with it. And it doesn't matter what the first thing that you make is. It's going to be the worst thing you make, but it will be something that you've made. I think um, something that you said that was really interesting was about the this place that VR is within education around, well, is it actually something that is of, of use, um, or is it a bit of a gimmick? Is it something, you know, a bit of a toy for people to play with? Um, and I still think that we're in that place where uh, in education, you need to do quite a lot of justifying in order to, uh, to, mm. to kind of, especially get those budgets in there for it. But actually, um, when you show people an application and, and you show people students' reactions to that application, I've only ever had positive feedback. Mm.